Hello, my name's John Talbot, and together with Catherine Westbrook, I am co-author of the book MRI in Practice, and also co-presenter of MRI in Practice Online. This is a course based on the book, currently available to 200 different international locations around the world. The aim of this short presentation is to introduce the fundamentals of MRI, and to give you a very small taste of what we offer on the full course. To keep it very simple, I'm only going to show you three slides. The first will look at magnetism, the second will look at resonance, and the third will look at imaging. Whenever we conduct an MRI scan, the anatomical region to be imaged must be positioned at the isocenter of a large, powerful, homogeneous magnetic field. Most modern high-field MRI scanners use solenoid electromagnets to achieve this, but there are also scanners available that use permanent magnets positioned above and below the patient, so-called open scanners. My computer model shows a large segmented solenoid electromagnet. Each of these cylinders contain windings of superconductive niobium-titanium wire bathed in a cryogen, a liquid helium and many kilometres of wire may be required to achieve a high field. The resulting lines of magnetic flux run down the length of the scanner bore, and as field strength increases, the more densely packed those flux lines become. In physics, the uppercase letter B is used as an abbreviation for magnetic flux density, and because this is the primary field, it's known as B0. The field strength that I'm using here in my example is 1 tesla. Human scanners tend to range between 0.5 and 3 tesla for clinical scans and up to 10 teslas for research. And to give you an idea of just how powerful a 1 tesla magnet is, it's about the same flux density as a junkyard magnet that's used to pick up scrapped motor vehicles. So a very powerful magnetic field. Right at the centre of the scanner, there is an area where the magnetic field is very homogeneous. This can be visualised as an approximately spherical volume, 40 to 50 centimetres in diameter, across which the field strength varies by less than 5 parts per million. And it's at the centre of this imaging volume that the anatomy of interest is positioned. This volume of tissue consists mainly of carbon, oxygen and hydrogen, Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, accounting for approximately 75% of everything that exists. And because of the high water content in the human body, about 62% of the atoms are hydrogen atoms. This is a factor known as proton density. If we ignore oxygen and carbon, and just look at the hydrogen nuclei, it can be seen that they are single, positively charged particles rotating on their axes. And this gives them an induced magnetic field, represented by the white vectors on my model. As you can imagine, the primary field of the scanner has an effect on these magnetic vectors, causing them to align with the main magnetic field in one of two directions, either parallel, aligned with the flux lines of B0, or anti-parallel in the opposite direction. The factor that determines this orientation is the energy state of each nucleus. Hydrogen nuclei can exhibit two discrete energy states. Nuclei having a low energy state will align parallel to the external field, a state known as spin-up. But if a nucleus has a high enough energy to oppose the external field, its vector will align anti-parallel, or spin down. If we just freeze the animation, you can see that at any given moment in time, there is likely to be more low energy spins, shown in blue, than high energy spins, here shown in red. There is a surfeit of low energy blue nuclei because it's easier to align with the external field than oppose it. If the external field strength is increased, it becomes more difficult to oppose it and we get even more vectors aligned parallel. If we do a subtraction here, subtracting the reds from the blues, we would end up with a net magnetic vector aligned parallel to B0. And as you can see in my model, the vector wobbles around on its axis like a spinning top. In MRI, we call this little system a spin packet, or spin for short. The official term used to describe this wobble is precession. 
The speed at which the vector precesses is also dependent on the external field, and it's known as the Larmor frequency. This frequency is proportional to the flux density of the external field. At 1 tesla, the frequency is 42.58 MHz. At 1.5 teslas, it increases to 63.87 MHz, and so on. So, this is the reason that an MRI scanner uses a magnet. It allows us to create a net magnetic vector from the hydrogen nuclei. But how are we going to use this to get a measurable signal from the body tissues? Well, this is where resonance comes in. So let's move on to slide 2. Resonance is defined as the transfer of energy from one oscillating body to another. In this case, resonance is achieved using electromagnetic radiation, which is applied at the same resonant frequency as the precessing hydrogen vectors. Coincidentally, this frequency is in the radio broadcasting range of the electromagnetic spectrum. But more relevant is the fact that it creates a secondary oscillating magnetic field known as B1 at 90 degrees to the primary field B0. When we apply this RF pulse, two things happen. The spins start to precess in sync. We say that they are in phase. And because resonance involves a transfer of energy into the system, some of the low energy spins will gain enough energy to oppose the main magnetic field. The scanner can calculate the exact amount of energy required to balance the two spin populations. And you can see on the model that we now have as many blues as reds. If we combine these vectors, as shown by the red and blue arrows, we can see that by applying the RF pulse, we have flipped the net magnetic vector into the transverse plane, 90 degrees to B0, shown here by the purple arrow. Some people get a bit confused by this and think that the hydrogen nuclei have been flipped on their sides, but as you can see, this is not the case. All that has changed is their energy levels. This net magnetic vector precesses at 90 degrees to B0 at the Larmor frequency. And this is important because we can now measure the vector by placing an RF receiver coil close to the patient. The rotating vector will induce a corresponding alternating voltage in the receiver coil. This can be explained by Michael Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. You may recall from your school days, perhaps, that Michael Faraday moved an electromagnet in and out of a secondary wire coil, inducing an alternating voltage in the secondary coil. And this alternating waveform represents the signal returning from the patient during the MRI scan. So to summarise, through a process of resonance, the RF pulses create transverse magnetization that can be detected by a receiver coil. If we can deduce where that signal originated, we can use it to make a morphological image of the patient. So let's move on to my final slide to see how that works. Creating an image requires three distinct steps. Firstly, the scanner must locate a cross-sectional slice of tissue or tomogram and then locate the signal returning from the horizontal and vertical axes of that slice. Spatial encoding requires the use of magnetic field slopes or gradients. I mentioned earlier that the scanner has a solenoid electromagnet that creates a homogeneous imaging volume. But the scanner also contains three other secondary electromagnets known collectively as gradient coils. Each of these coils can be activated independently or in tandem to create slopes along the main magnetic field, and the current can be applied at different amplitudes and in different directions. If the current is caused to flow in counter-rotating directions at each end of the coil, or perhaps each side of the coil, a secondary magnetic field will be induced, adding to or subtracting from the main magnetic field. Between these two extremes, there will be a linear slope or gradient across the imaging volume. My model represents an increase in flux density shown in red and a decrease in flux density shown in blue. This gradient is in the z-direction along the length of the magnet bore. So, how do we select a slice? 
Staying with the concept of resonance for a minute, you may remember from your physics lessons that tuning forks are a good example of how resonance works. If two tuning forks share the same frequency, there can be a transfer of energy from one to the other by resonance. Because precessional frequency is proportional to flux density, we can represent the resonant frequencies of the spins along a gradient with imaginary tuning forks of different sizes. Let's imagine that there are five possible slice positions in the data set. They will all have different frequencies from the high to the low end of the gradient, like this. If we apply RF at a particular frequency, it will only excite the spins along the gradient that share that frequency. So let's compare the transmitted frequency with the precessional frequency of the bottom slice at the high field red end of the gradient. Well, I hope you could tell that the transmitted frequency was lower than the precessional frequency of the spins at that location. And the same applies if we compare the transmitted frequency with the topmost slice. It's not the same frequency. The transmitted RF in this case happens to be at the center frequency. So while the slice select gradient is switched on, the RF will only resonate spins at the very center of the imaging volume, like this. Because the center of the gradient remains at the center frequency. So here is our axial slice location shown in red. Only the tissue inside this slice has been at the correct frequency to be resonated by the excitation pulse. The next task is to locate the signal returning from inside that slice. Let's consider the horizontal axis first. Once again, this is going to require the use of a gradient. But before we apply another gradient, I just want to introduce a new concept. Spatial encoding in MRI uses a mathematical process known as the Fast Fourier Transform, and I wanted to introduce this concept in a way that many of you will already be familiar with. This is my mobile phone running a music player app, and the part that I want to draw your attention to is this bouncing histogram display. This is called a spectrum analyzer, and you've probably seen something like this before, perhaps on your own phone or maybe on a hi-fi system. A digital recording, like an MP3, is not unlike an MRI signal. It's a waveform having a finite length, it has a certain sampling rate, and it contains a wide range of frequencies at different amplitudes. This spectrum analyzer uses fast Fourier transformation to display the individual frequencies that comprise the piece of music. Low bass notes to the left and high pitched frequencies to the right. Bearing this in mind, let's return to the scan and apply a gradient in the X direction, horizontally from left to right. This is known as a frequency encoding gradient. It creates a linear range of Larmor frequencies across the field of view. And as such, we could use a musical analogy to represent this, namely a piano keyboard. The center frequency could be represented by middle C on the keyboard. With higher frequencies to the patient's left and lower frequencies to the right. During an MRI acquisition, we collect the signal repeatedly, not just once, but perhaps 256 or 512 times. And as we collect the signal each time, we sample the signal amplitude, basically taking little snapshot measurements as the signal is collected by the receiver coil. And there could be 256 or perhaps 512 of these measurements taken each time. This results in a grid of data. To keep it simple, this grid of data has just 30 rows, each representing one signal collection, and each row has 30 sampling points, the little blue dots. Importantly, the amplitude of each sample point is not the same as the amplitude of the signal returning from the apparently equivalent pixel on the image. So how does the scanner know the amplitude of each pixel? 
Well, we saw on slide 2 that when we collect the signal, it's a waveform, and in the example that I showed, it only contained one frequency. With the gradient switched on, however, it will contain a whole range of frequencies. So, if we look at this row of data points, and we plot their amplitude over time, it will look like this on the oscilloscope. And as you can see, it's a rather more complex waveform than the one that I showed on slide 2, because the amplitude of each sample point is a combination of all of the different frequencies that are returning from the patient at this moment in time. If the scanner can identify these frequencies, it can assign them a spatial location along the axis of the gradient. Let's perform a spectrum analysis like the one on my phone. Well, we've got 30 bars on this histogram, each representing a different frequency and a different amplitude. And it looks nothing like the display on the oscilloscope. The purple waveform shows amplitude over time, but the histogram shows amplitude over a range of frequencies. If we assign a grayscale value to each amplitude, you can see that we could hypothetically achieve spatial resolution along the x-axis of the image. In fact, this is an oversimplification. But when Professor Paul Lauterbur created the first NMR image in 1973, this is pretty much how he did it. On an MRI scanner, however, every single sample point in the data contributes something to every single pixel on the image. To keep it simple, we could just take a look at some examples of sample points that might contribute to the vertical spatial resolution of the image. This will also require a gradient application, this time in the anteroposterior y direction. This gradient is known as the phase encoding gradient, and it's manipulated over the duration of the entire image acquisition. I mentioned earlier that we collect the signal repeatedly over the course of the scan, and the amplitude of this gradient, and indeed the polarity of the gradient, is modified for each repetition. As a result, it will affect the phase coherence and therefore the amplitude of the signal returning from the patient for each of these vertical sample points. And when plotted out, the resulting waveform looks almost exactly the same as the one that we just looked at in the frequency encoding example. Unsurprisingly, a fast Fourier transformation of this data will therefore begin to provide resolution in the vertical axis of the image. In reality, when a Fourier transformation is applied to all of the data shown in this grid, uh, known as k-space, the scanner is able to interrogate spatial information of varying densities and in hundreds of different directions, not just horizontally and vertically as I have shown in this example. And with a sample rate of 512 or greater, the spatial resolution of the image will be considerably better than my 30 pixel model. Well, that brings us to the end of this rather short presentation on MRI. Of course, we've only scratched the surface of a very wide and deep topic. And if you're interested to discover more, you can get the full story from our book, MRI in Practice. If you enjoyed the style of this lecture and found the computer graphics or the analogies helpful, you might like to consider attending our full course, MRI in Practice Online. It's a four-day course with over 18 hours of streaming high-definition lectures like the one I've just shown you. It also includes live question and answer sessions and revision sessions that cover everything that you need to know about MRI in a very user-friendly format. The course usually attracts CPD accreditation for the country in which the course is offered, and participants have found the course to be very useful as an adjunct to formal academic study, as well as for continuing professional development. So we hope to see you on the course, but for now, thanks for watching.